coming at you from the decentralized earth. You're listening to Christo on Crypto. Hello and welcome to another episode of Christo on Crypto. David Chaum, the well-known scientist and cryptographer, joins us today. Aside from several cryptographic protocols, he's most well known for founding DigiCash in 1989. We talked a little bit about how he got started, the early distrust of the government and the authorities. We talked a little bit about Tor and some interesting theories around it. We also question, is privacy a natural cost for growth? Some of the risks of end-to-end encryption the Elixir project, which he founded, and what it aims to solve, the growth and development of the crypto space, and finally, David's seminal paper. The link's in the description. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. David Chom, how are you? Hey, great. So it's a pleasure to finally be on your podcast with you. Well, the uh, pleasure's all mine, and thanks for coming on. Tell us a little bit about how you got started. Ooh, well, um, you know, when I was uh, just uh, knee-high to a grasshopper, I uh, was interested in things like locks and, uh, like, I guess a lot of little kids, secret yeah. codes <laughs> and uh, that sort of thing. But, you know, that was about the time of the Vietnam War and, and other stuff. And wow. I sensed that these kinds of security mechanisms you know like it's really hard to find a hidden thing mm. you know or you can't guess a secret you know there's a real power and a strength there and i had the feeling at an early age that that was the kind of thing that could give the public power over the government or uh, protect the public's interest in uh, because it, you, you know, it's things that were going down because it didn't seem like there was a perfect alignment to me between uh, what the general public wanted and what the government was up to. I suppose the early work when it came to crypto started with uh, DigiCash, of course, uh, and I believe that was 1990 when you sort of uh, first kind of got involved with that. Tell us what the environment was around that kind of time. Was there this sort of distrust of the government like we have now in this whole fake news environment? Uh, or was it more of a, of a general sort of malaise and apathy towards the government? Well, actually, you know, I was doing research in cryptography while I was still an undergraduate at the University of California. Mm -hmm. And I did some projects, papers, I wrote little papers about how you could use cryptography to secure computers and build it sort of into the architecture of the hardware and keep the data in there encrypted and make Mm -hmm. sure that it wasn't being, uh, you know, operated on by the wrong instructions and and this sort of thing and then when I went uh, also um, finally to uh, Berkeley as a graduate student I started to really uh, think about how cryptography could be used to protect the interests of society Mm -hmm. so one of the things that you know so privacy and payments was, you see, in the environment in those days was one in which, well, the public really distrusted government. Us graduate students at Berkeley mm. thought that all the possible jobs we could get after leaving were kind of uh, working for the man and they <laughs> were, uh, you know, evil. And we should try to find uses for technology that would benefit uh, the public. And um, I was very interested in privacy, but it was not an unusual interest 
in those days, you know, most people today don't remember that in that period, it was, we were still feeling the repercussions from when the public first started seeing, let's say, their name on a punch card mm -hmm. or on a computer printout in the mail, they would get a, you know, a bill or something and they would see, oh, a computer knows my name or my date of birth mm -hmm. or whatever. And, uh, this freaked people out, uh, perhaps rightfully so, and they were very concerned about personal privacy in the information age. That's the way it was uh, described. And there were, you know, government studies, and the Rand Corporation wrote a whole, uh, you know, four or five hundred page book about this. And there were laws, and the public was all riled up about this issue. And so it was natural that I tried to see how I might be able to apply these codes uh, and, in, and computers to protect this sort of, uh, of information and these vulnerabilities. And that's what I, um, I did. And I actually chose voting mm -hmm. as a kind of a, you know, toy example of how you could use cryptography to protect privacy because it seemed to me it was a simple enough setting that you know kids know about voting right mm -hmm. that where you could apply it and and uh and start to you know sink your teeth to get get the first uh get some traction in, in uh solving some of these more elaborate privacy issues and i remember sitting in the hot tub with my uh, professor in, in his backyard yeah. and, uh, <laughs> under the redwood trees in North uh, Berkeley. And, you know, we're thinking, talking about <clears throat> this. And I, um, yeah, that's when I came up with the basic mixing. Mm. Uh, and that article that became my master's thesis at Berkeley. And if you look at the mixing, which is like, you know, where Tor stole some of their ideas. Yeah, the of, onion rooter. Yeah. The onion rooter is fake mixing, right? I mean, they, it's a honeypot. Yeah. They claim that it's mixing, but it's only three steps paid for by the CIA. So wow. it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, that, so they, st they still won't acknowledge my work on their website, even though, you know, there was a Tor coup. Yeah, yeah. That all, yeah. the entire, now how is it possible, answer me this, mm -hmm. for the ex entire board of a nonprofit entity to be fired and then replaced by other bozos. It's not really decentralized. It's not really um, what it seems to be because otherwise it would have ceased to exist mm -hmm. if all the power was, there's no stockholders in a nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. So and I think it's simply a proprietary of the CIA. Um, but in any event, did you notice that? The Apple bomb thing, did you read about all that? Apple bomb, quite fascinating. A few years ago, the entire executive, the entire board of directors of Tor was fired. Oh, yes, yeah. And then replaced. Yeah, yeah. And there was no real explanation of it or how that was structurally possible or what they're really doing there. But, yeah. I, I suppose, assuming that this was um, some kind of CIA creation or, or something. It was created by the National Security Agency. Roger Dingledine was an employee of the National Security Agency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then he went on to Naval Research Laboratory to found Tor. Does it matter for the user? It's, it's paid for by the CIA and the State Department, 50-50, essentially, for its whole life. Does that matter? Well, well, I mean, blockchain's all about incentives, right? Right, right. So, David, it's very interesting to hear about your work uh, during your master's. So, I guess the next question is, what did you do for your PhD? Well, that's... Uh, a whole other thing, it's uh, it's kind of a story which uh, hasn't been told until just a few weeks ago. Right. Um, you know, when you do your PhD, normally uh, you give, you know, you turn in your, your thesis, right? And you get this form back. It says, you know, click here and uh, or sign this, and we're going to publish your dissertation at Dissertation Abstracts. And anyone in the world who wants to get a copy, you know, they can for 50 bucks or whatever, 
they'll print them up a copy and send it and you know whenever someone searches the you know everything about your dissertation will come up and then mm -hmm. abs you're the abstract of it will be published on their website and you'll get you know certificates for them and all this stuff right but being a like you know really crypto security you know digital autonomy uh personal sovereignty kind of a guy I, I said no way i'm keeping the copyright to my dissertation i'm not going along with this i'm, I'm owning it and so i filed it and uh you know you had to print it out on carbon i mean on a cotton paper yeah uh like uh three copies and they had to be you know perfect and um uh, and 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 deposited with the library, and that's where they stayed for the last thirty five years. Really, wow. pretty much, except you know how you can see inside of a library book, there's like a little piece of paper where they stamp it when someone checks it out. Yeah, yeah. And you often yeah. don't see who checked it out, but you see the date they took it and when it was returned. It turned out that it had been checked out by apparently a faculty member. Why? Because you, uh, as a student or what you know, or industrial, whatever, you can't keep a library book out of the main Doe Library at Berkeley for more than a, I don't know a few weeks, mm -hmm. right? But faculty can just check it out for like a year. Yeah. So it was checked out for a year, and uh, but that dissertation actually contained a. And this has now been uh, published in a refereed journal article that just appeared a few weeks ago. Uh, it's, uh, that it contained all of the elements of blockchain apart from except just the proof of work. This was 1982. So the proof of work was, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, Dworkin or... I mean, a long six time years, ago. Yeah. 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 And not only, it's not like, oh, there was some sentence that said, oh, maybe blockchain. Mm -hmm. No, it had the words chain of block in it. And it was a, uh, a written in a formal specification language. So in other words, it looked like a high level programming language. It told you exactly how to do every uh, thing and in, 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 including the hashing of the previous block to make the new uh, block, it's all in there, and the consensus algorithm and uh, uh, state transition diagrams for all the different um, types. So, in, in fact, the article that appeared recently said that it, the dissertation included all known aspects of all known blockchains, uh, permissioned and unpermissioned, everything except the proof of work. It's wow. all in there. And yeah, so, uh, and moreover, later I was able to, not I mean, not that much later, uh, when I was teaching at NYU, the Graduate School of Business, I hired someone to help me because the language that the specifications were written in was called SETTLE, S-E-T-T-L, I forget what that stands for anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an interpreter for it that had been written by people at NYU and I got one of these people to help me uh, actually run the code that was the specification of the dissertation. So we had to like make up all the, uh, you know, constants and an initial example, how many nodes and what the initial uh, state was and so on. But we actually, you know, there might have been a few errors that we had to fix, but basically we got it running. Well, I'd certainly advise our more technical listeners to go and check that out. Where, where can they go and have a look? Uh, you can see it uh, on my uh, website under the publications from the hamburger menu, or you can, you know, you can request it from uh, UC Berkeley. Great stuff. Centralization, to me, seems like an initial step towards embracing technology. And what I mean by that is you talked about uh, having your name on a printout. And of course, um, over the years, we've seen that the way that centralized institutions handle data, Facebook with Cambridge Analytica, Apple with data that they have on their users, Google with all of its analytics, is that not just a symptom of incentives, 
given to a centralized party that takes forward this technology and it's then natural for decentralization to sort of come in once the incentives have been exploited by a centralized party. I mean, what's the point of Facebook creating this behemoth if they're not going to make money from it? So is this just a natural cause in this capitalist society we live in or can we strive to be better? Well, so that's, uh, um, you know, quite an insightful way to look at all this. And I think it, it captures a lot of what's going on. I mean, it's, you know, once something is built out and people are happily using it to get done what they thought they needed to get done, then the next level of nice to have and optional stuff becomes the new need. Mm. And then they, mm. they try to try to make that happen. So in a, in, you know, this, like, I think fundamental basic sense, uh, all of information technology infrastructure uh, is built out for profit typically, although, you know, there were quite a few nonprofit projects back in, when I was at Berkeley, you know, there was Project Xanadu and the mm. American Information Exchange and the Community Memory Project and a lot of, you know, home control. there were a lot of different electronic wealth. There were a lot of different uh, blockchain-like endeavors to use technology in a more humanistic uh, way, way, but we didn't have that surplus of computers in those days. Mm -hmm. To Access just to, have yeah. uh, to use a kind of blockchain approach, you know, that's a little over the top in terms of uh, efficiency. We base barely had, you know, enough computing power to get the basic uh, computing done. But so yeah, then once you uh, achieve that basic level of functionality and reliability, uh, and, and the consumers are are happy, then they look for this this next level. And what it fundamentally and generally is, I believe, very often is that people would like to be able to do all that same stuff, but keep control over their own uh, information, to be able to do it with some level of uh, privacy and some level of control over their own information. And simultaneously, with some level of ability to gain credit for having done it anyways. Right. Those are somewhat at odds with each other, but people like the idea of reputation and building up their reputation and getting credit and, you know... Uh, it's almost a sort of a narcissistic thing to some extent. It, that there's, yes, there's th that... And there's the 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 pure utility of um, being able to have earned digital dignity. So that's not just the kind of you know social media mm. kind of uh, kids want to show off thing, but there's also like that you are a real user of you have contributed to the community. You know, you should be uh, listened to. You know, there are a lot of. There were even schemes back in the day where, you know, those people who contributed good answers or agreed with what other what with the answers that were widely agreed with or um, that asked questions that generated a lot of interest or whatever were rewarded with a certain mm -hmm. kind of currency that allowed them then to ask more questions or have their answers more widely heard and, and so on. So I'm not going to say it's a negative thing. My point is just that it, there's, uh, you know, a, a, at least a couple of types of aspects mm -hmm. of stuff that seems on the face of it somewhat contradictory to the autonomy and privacy uh, and, and, and control of your own information aspect. This is a fascinating tension, 
uh, that I've been able to actually find some, you know, I think good solutions to that are uh, simple enough and elegant enough and, and directly useful enough that, that they uh, could be meaningful. And I, I try to call them credential mechanisms. Uh, I wrote about them in my Scientific American article, uh, Achieving Electronic Privacy, right. for example. One of your uh, projects is, of course, trying to create a new messaging system that is fully encrypted and fully private. Most people, when you think of a privacy messaging service, would think of Telegram, Signal, maybe WhatsApp even. Mm. Of course, they utilize end-to-end -end encryption, but mm. they are administered by a centralized party. Yeah. Tell us about Elixir and how it's looking to solve that problem um, and also integrate payments at the same time. It's a well-put question. So only recently, in the last weeks, has, at least in the U.S. media, acknowledged that the end-to-end -end encryption of message content is probably a smokescreen for, it's like a fake feature that's designed to mislead the public into thinking that their privacy is being protected and that the real issue is what's now referred to, I think euphemistically, as metadata, the who talks to who and when, the complete social graph of all your interactions, where you are and how you interact with various uh, this is products amazing. and so on. Yeah. That metadata, is is it possible to work out who it belongs to? Or is it a case of... Well, yes, depending who you are. Like Mark yeah. Zuckerberg wrote a 20-page, 2,500-word uh, article or something making clear that to him it was obvious that he owned it, all of your metadata, all of everyone's metadata. And he was, of course, uniquely... Uh, position to use it to protect you from spam mm. and that your the, the secrecy of your messages however the message content well that was he wasn't really going to guarantee that to you even but that he would create a public process involving experts that would take years that would try to decide a suitable way to uh, have your message content encrypted. Um, that's what his essay said, and you can read the dozen or, I mean, serious, significant articles that that engendered in the in the in the in the media. Um, all, just take it apart. No one article fell for it. They all just yeah. said, "Hey, this it's is clear. wrong." It's, 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 yeah. Doesn't make a sense. There's no way you could, any sense you could, uh, you know, still be in business if you don't spy on people. And hey, wait a minute, this metadata, you know, that's pro that. Why doesn't that belong to people? And I wrote back like, yeah. So Zuckerberg claimed that the whole change in the demographics was all these young people were coming in and they weren't interested in the stream they wanted to use me messaging more and so what i said is well yeah he's trying to fool them into believing that end to end encryption is all the privacy that they need and that and to sort of keep them from demanding control over uh their metadata it's mm. um so in some sense zuckerberg's campaign uh, backfired on him mm -hmm. and now the public is aware that in order to sort of take back their informational lives from the likes of Facebook and uh, uh, Google and so forth mm -hmm. they need to have control over the metadata so right. the the game is, uh, is kind almost. of up yeah. yeah now that now the public is aware of that and there is no other messaging system that protects metadata other than Elixir. The reason is because the original mixing, which I worked on while I was at Berkeley, um, you know, it worked fine, but and there's been 5,300 articles that reference my original article, right. believe it or not, wow. what I read. But no one has found a way 
to actually speed the mixing up mm -hmm. to the point where you could use it for chat. Until a few years ago, I uh, found a way to speed it up by a factor of a thousand. And how do you do that? Well, it, 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 okay, it's slightly misleading, but we st you still have to do the same amount of computing. But I found a way to, to allow the nodes to do it in advance while they're waiting around and other nodes are, are running the network. And so uh, when a message comes in, all the computing that's needed to forward that message through a series of nodes, uh, not just three hops, but like eight hops right. around the world, right. uh, has already been done. And it can be done extremely efficiently. It's just like a single multiply per node. So you, the nodes don't have to know who's or what message is going to come in in what slot. Those slots are ready. It's It doesn't care what the data is. It, it'll just like store it and send it through. Yeah, so it's, a, it's extremely efficient, but there was a price to pay, which you did have to do all that computing, but it's done in advance and it's just uh, waiting around. And that's not really a problem in blockchain because we have like a thousand times more computers yeah. uh, than we need anyway so it all works out so i mean i suppose if it if it uh were to scale are there any limitations um no it really i mean as a scientist i guess you never say there's no limitations but uh surprisingly our mixing scales extremely nicely you can say technically that it scales linearly and in operations sense that means just if it you need to double the amount of messages you just put a second computer triplet put a third computer but there are other ways that we can uh, scale it as well so it, it it can be scaled in different ways but none of them really uh, run into any kind of barrier so we can easily get to a million transactions a second which is like pretty much what you would mostly ever want uh, with just uh, normal server class uh, uh, nodes, which mm -hmm. is uh, is the real question, you know, because if you have, a, have like a supercomputer center per node, yeah, that yeah. wouldn't uh, be, you know, fair. So is the the scaling related to more of the, the the payment system within the app, or are you are you saying that it's the messaging as well that sort of requires uh, that scaling solution? What's more difficult to scale up and uh, make fast at the same time? Well, both the scaling and the and the and the I mean, pardon me, both the messaging and the payment scale without any real problem. The messaging scales linearly okay. with the number of messages per second, and the payments, unlike almost all other blockchains, uh, and even the original eCash, does not require that a record be kept um, anywhere of all those like payments that have been spent like against double spending it only has to keep a so-called whitelist mm -hmm. uh, or whatever you want to call it of those numbers which have value currently so it's pretty parsimonious with uh memory as well okay what can we look forward to then uh when it comes to elixir and the rest of the year well we've been uh, uh really delighted at, uh, at Elixir to receive so much support, well, both kind of like very generous uh, investments and by luminaries in the field and uh, under favor very favorable terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly, a lot, hundreds of people have uh, come forward and participated in our very open beta node process where they uh, have parts, they filled out uh, surveys, they've completed application forms that are quite extensive, mm -hmm. that respond to uh, the, the issues that the survey showed were wanted. And uh, so we have uh, over 500 nodes, I think, that right. have applied to, to be nodes for free in our beta test, right. uh, just to support us. And so uh, we've got some uh, really exciting, um, I mean, extraordinary things that we'll be uh, announcing 
uh, some at consensus coming up in in, in May in, yeah. May, a, in New York, and um, we also have uh, real breakthrough technologies which have not been announced uh, publicly. So yeah, there's a, a lot, uh, um, a lot of exciting uh, stuff happening. Mm -hmm. Finally, I'm sure you've been to conferences all around the world, and we know in the last couple of years numbers have swelled even in this bear market. I just want to ask you on a personal note, how does it feel seeing so many people involved in this cryptocurrency and blockchain space, whether it be for speculation or for uh, building technologies for the future, compared to what it was like in, in the early days? Well, it's it's a fantastic. Um, you know, I've touched on a lot of different industry sectors and uh, aspects of society over the years that I've never seen anything like blockchain where most of the key people are really ethos driven mm. and that is uh like so exciting and so refreshing and so uh you know fantastic um so but i will say you say there's a lot of conferences so it seems to be so many people a lot of those people are the same people yes and it's so true. weird <laughs> that you run into these people and you never run into them in their hometown. You always run into them in some other place. Yeah, yeah. And you say, oh, I'm here, you know, in Paris for these two days or these three days of the conference. And, say, and they, uh, can we get together tomorrow? And they say, oh, no, I'm I'm only here for the first day. And then I'm leaving tonight. And, I'll, you know, and it's like, oh, my God. I mean, you, you're you living, uh, you know, the digital nomad thing is sick. It gets, it tired. I went around the planet several times. And then I decided, you know what? I'm going to hire a videographer. I'm going to document this, and I, you can see it up on Elixir.io. You can see the web, uh, our, the whole keynote thing. And now I'm sort of, you know, if you're interested in having me give a keynote or or seeing what it's like to be a digital nomad, I've got it condensed down to 12 minutes. <laughs> you can watch it, and I'm I'm going to take it a little bit easier. Yeah, brilliant. Well, um, David, we'll be sure to follow the progress of the Elixir project. And uh, we wish you the best of success. And thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hey, it was so great. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening and for all your support. It means we can continue to have some great interviews and conversations about the blockchain and crypto space. Please like, share, retweet, and tell your friends. Crypto on Crypto is here for you. And if you have any feedback or any requests, don't hesitate to get in touch on the usual channels. We've got some very interesting interviews planned for the next few weeks. So do stay subscribed. And once again, we'll see you at the next episode. Thanks for listening. Take care.